Thanks everyone. Welcome to this much anticipated webinar hosted by Four Thought India, featuring over 5,000 plus students from prestigious institutes from all across this country. We are happy to announce that this is an event which is open for all, with participation from all over the all over the country, with the sole aim of breaching the gap in education, with the guidance and wisdom of our respected speakers here today. The session will be followed by an open question and answer round. We have three distinguished scholars amongst us today who will be gracing us with their words of intellect. And I would request everyone to interact and be a part, an active part of this wonderful initiative. To begin with, we have Marcus J. Bueller, distinguished professional, a McAfee professor of engineering at MIT who directs MIT's laboratory for atomistic and molecular mechanics. He served as the head of department civil and environmental engineering from 2013 till 2020. From 2018 to 2020, he served terms as president elect, president and past president of the Society of Engineering Science. Marcus' research focuses on how protein, protein materials define life and how they fail catastrophically due to disease. His work has shown how biological materials achieve extraordinary properties through multi-scale hierarchy rather than through the diversity of the underlying building blocks and has designed lighter, stronger, and durable materials. Working at the interface of art and science, he is a composer of experimental music with an interest in sonification and developed a method in to translate material structure into musical form and vice versa. Realizing a materialization of sonic information in biomaterials protein design. He's well known for his development of the material musical compositional technique. His scholarly work includes more than 450 peer reviewed journal articles in journals like Nature, Nature Materials, Science Advances, PNAS, Advanced Materials, and others, with about 30,000 citations. Marcus has del delivered hundreds of plenary and keynote speeches around the world. Marcus received the NFA NSF Career Award, the United States Air Force Young Investigator Award, the Navy Young Investigator Award, and the DARPA Young Faculty Award, as well as the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. In 2010, he received MIT's Harold E. Edgerton Faculty Achievement Award, for exceptional distinction in teaching and in research or scholarship. Other awards include the TMS Hardy Award, the IEEE Holm Conference Mott Antler Lecture Award, the MRS Outstanding Young Investigator Award, the SES Young Investigator Medal, the TJR Hughes Young Investigator Award, the NEMAD NASA Medal, the R.W. Raymond Memorial Award, the Brunner Award, the Leonardo da Vinci Award, and the Alfred Nobel Prize 2020-2012, given by the Combined Engineering Societies of the United States. He was selected as a 2018 highly cited researcher for producing multiple highly cited papers ranking in the top 1% for a publication field. In 2019, he received the Materials Horizons Outstanding Paper Prize by the Royal Society of Chemistry and was named as one of the top 0.09% of researchers worldwide in nanoscience in 2020's world ranking of scientists by Stanford University. Marcus serves as a member of the editorial board of many international publications and has chaired many committees. With this long introduction of this outstanding scholar, it gives me immense pleasure to pass on the mic, the stage to Mr. Marcus Jepula. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the um, um, for the introduction. Um, and I also want to thank you, especially for inviting me. It's um, you know very special to speak uh, to such a large audience and such a diverse audience, and to further the mission of education, uh, which of course is really uh, close to my heart. And uh, so, what what I'll do in this next uh, 40, 45 minutes or so um, before we go to the questions, um, I'll go through. The, um, the work we do in the lab at MIT here um, to assess how we can engineer materials, design materials, and also using some unconventional approaches, which I think is the, the job of every scientist and engineer is to uh, challenge the status quo in how we do things. And we're trying to do that in my lab uh, 
by using uh, music and sound and art to advance engineering and creativity. So what we do is we, we look at materials um, and you can pick your favorite material structure. I have a, a architectural material here. Um, and it, if you look at it, you can see it consists of multiple scales. Um, the things you can see with your eyes, like the Eiffel Tower, the trusses, the I-beams, but actually, if you look inside the material, uh, you're gonna see there are additional structures inside. They're grains, they're molecules, um, ultimately they're atoms in the material, and the world of chemistry and quantum mechanics begins to rule. And our work deals with understanding materials from this holistic perspective. We um, aim to um, model materials from the quantum chemical scale all the way to the macro level, and we use a, a host of techniques for this, including it's called molecular dynamics simulations, finite element modeling. Some of you might be familiar with this as engineers, um, all the way to using artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning techniques to advance understanding primarily for our, for our lab, how materials behave mechanically and how they break and how they fail. You can kind of see the failure process here. We also are very passionate about nature and biological materials, and we really are aiming to understand how biological living organisms like a spider, like shown here, um, create materials, um, how they generate web structures as shown here, um, by what mechanisms the silk threads are woven together into a three-dimensional architecture with incredible exquisite detail and information. Um, and ultimately, these web structures you saw on the previous slide um, of the spiders, um, they consist again of molecules, and these molecules are proteins in this case, and they kind of are like little Lego building blocks that are assembled by the spider um, in fact, assembled from a, a soup of random collection of building blocks. This is sort of how it looks like in the spider's body after the spider eats the fly, um, assembled into a, a beautiful architecture like the spider web structure. Now, this has immense implications understanding nature at that level, um, not only for engineering, synthetic things, but also for one of the great aims of our time, and that is to advance sustainability. And, and here's a little plug for a TED talk I gave recently actually in India um, uh, to discuss how biomaterials can be a platform for, su for sustainability. So you can uh, check that out if you want to learn a little bit more about that angle of the work. Um, the, um, sort of the, the, the fascination with biological systems and spiders and, and any other animals that build materials um, is, is that these are you know, processes of self-assembly. These materials come together from these random Lego building blocks and they form beautiful structures like a web structure with incredible detail, which we as engineers can mine for information and data, right? So engineers, as engineers, we can uh, take a web structure like this, we can build a model as we sh we've done here with our collaborator, Tomas Saracino, um, and um, putting it together in a three-dimensional model that we can then 3D print, for example. So on the left-hand side, you see a, a 3D printed spider web that is mimicking what nature has done. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see some other web structures that are more organized and playing with this narrative of organization and disorder in a very meaningful way uh, to create engineered structures. And we'll, I'll talk much more about those in, in the next um, you know, minutes or so. But um, what's fascinating is this relationship of how um, you know, biological systems assemble. And this is a movie here that shows the self-assembly, the folding of a protein, which happens um, all the time in your body as you grow, as you age, as your cells do their job. Um, our bodies produce proteins and these proteins self-organize into three-dimensional structures as shown here. And this organization happens through DNA, uh, amino acids, and has some really striking similarities to the way um, other things are assembling, including musical notes, for example. And I'll talk more about this in the next, in the second half of the talk, in how musical elements like notes and certain sounds come together, form the sound of a symphony, an orchestra. Um, and there are similarities in the way these assembly mechanisms work and how we can mine them, again, for creativity and engineering design. So um, all these materials I've talked about, I've shown you some pictures of spider silk and some other examples from biological materials. Um, these are all made from proteins, and these proteins, again, are made from amino acids. So these are sort of 20 unique um, letters or codes encoded in nature to create all life. Um, and by assembling these codes and letters in different patterns at different length and time scales, you can achieve remarkable materials. Here's another example for material we're studying in our lab, and that's uh, conch shells and nacre and materials that live in the ocean basically have remarkable hierarchical structures, uh, one of the toughest materials known. Um, and again, owing this due to this multi-scale architecture that I showed at the very beginning with the Eiffel Tower example. So these are engineered to really resist 
Fracture, for example, by creating an internal structure, you can see this here, this is an engineered system where we have 3D printed uh, an internal microstructure with an organization of threads and filaments that actually lead to a resistance of fracture. Now, how do you make materials resist fracture? Uh, and those of you who are maybe entering the engineering field and getting excited about you know, going to college or maybe getting a PhD or entering professional life, um, when you think about a material, um, even the material looks perfect, has internal cracks and fractures. And so what happens when you have an initial fracture, even small, it tends to grow. Um, and it grows because there's a stress concentration. And if you don't do anything special to your material, these uh, mathematical singularities of very high stresses at the tip of this crack here um, will lead to the fracture of chemical bonds and ultimately break the material. And if you um, are clever as an engineer, you can uh, mitigate this. And in fact, you can create an internal structure and actually make it very difficult for cracks to propagate. You can see in the bottom here, I've created a, a sort of a web structure of a soft material and a stiff and rigid material. And by doing this, um, I have prevented fracturing from happening. And you can see it's much more difficult for the right-hand side. There's some model predictions and experimental results for cracks to propagate. Okay, the other thing that we are you know, thinking about is not only how can we do this as an engineer using um, computers or models to come up with an optimal solution, but we're gonna look to nature and how nature actually optimizes or adapts materials. And of course, this happens through evolutionary mechanisms in, in biology. And um, you know, for example, the web structure is something that has evolved over billions of years. You know, spider species evolve, spiders build webs within a time scale of days uh, or weeks. And um, those are interesting questions. And what is the process by which, by which nature actually achieves design and manufacturing? And it's very different from what we're doing today in engineering, of course. And so what we're doing is we're using artificial intelligence to mimic some of those mechanisms, both human creativity, and I'll talk more about that and we'll talk about music at the end, um, as well as spiders sort of being a structural engineer to optimize and adapt um, the web structure to different threats to different scenarios. And we can only do this because we live in a um, uh, obviously challenging time in some degree, um, but also we as humanity civilization have achieved some remarkable things. Um, we have created computational um, environments and algorithms and, and tools and hardware that for the first time in history allow us to actually uh, simulate some of those neural networks, some of those artificially uh, simulated intelligent systems we see in nature uh, and actually approaching intelligence of simple organisms and ultimately perhaps uh, human intelligence and even beyond. Um, we can do this by you know, interacting quantum mechanically uh, using density functional theory, monocle dynamics and fed and modeling, all the tools that engineers use um, with these uh, new types of deep learning techniques. And this is um, perhaps the most exciting time um, I've ever worked in science. I've worked in science for about 20 years in engineering, but I think this is the most exciting time right now to, to really explore this whole new world opening up because we have advanced computation available. Um, and um, the I will show you this in a couple of examples. First one, I'm going to show um, how to prevent fracturing. I already talked about fracturing a little bit. And, and of course, fracturing is something that my lab has been studying um, for many years. Um, and typically, the problem is how do you understand how a crack propagates? You know, will it propagate, right? So you want to know if you have an airplane or if you work in a, in a factory or if you uh, work, you know, design a car or if you build a house, right? Or if you, you inspect skyscrapers, you want to know um, you know, whether that material will stands um, loading, right? Um, and so the question is, can we predict that? And typically what we do in engineering, we use finite element models or molecular models, and these are very slow. So it takes days to weeks to months sometimes to do a calculation. And so the question we're asking is, can we develop some entirely different ways of modeling the system using artificial intelligence to predict cracking from actually happening. And, and this can also be used, of course, designing materials. And once you know whether materials will propagate, uh, materials will fail, uh, you can also optimize these materials. And I'll talk much more about that. And the way we uh, you know, come to this is sort of going back a little bit in, in history, um, you know, for I would say hundreds of years, we have modeled materials um, and described engineering systems essentially based on Newton's laws or the, the tradition around Newton and Galileo and others and Kepler that have or have began to think about differential equations and observations in nature, um, ma mathematically categorizing them. And yeah, we have then figured out how to solve these, com these computationally in the last 50 years or so, engineers have made these advances. But um, we in the lab have sort of thought long about a different way to think about modeling and actually uh, started with um, a concept called matriomics, which um, is um, sort of the idea to describe materials based on the interaction of building blocks, um, which is a much more 
abstract categorization of how materials create function. So it really talks about the self-assembly of building blocks and interaction to create something as complex as a car or a vehicle or a dam or an airplane. And, and um, these interactions can be mathematically captured using a concept called category theory. And I won't have much time to talk more details, but if you're interested, there's references here and it's also in my book. Um, but category theory is sort of a mathematically pure form, which is beautiful um, and incredibly deep and, and inspiring, but very difficult to solve for real problems. It's uh, not possible to do a pen and paper calculation for a real airplane, for example, or real composite. And so deep learning has enabled us to do exactly this. And this is why we're so excited about deep learning is that we can actually using artificial intelligence, using neural networks and deep neural networks in particular, uh, we can begin to tackle some of those problems computationally. And I'll, I'll show you what that means in the next uh, minutes or so. But um, it's um, sort of a, a wealth of, of different techniques and I won't have time to discuss all the different methods in this talk, but I, I do, um, if you're interested, I teach a summer course every year. It's called Predictive Materials Design. Um, and uh, you can check it out. Uh, we have done uh, virtual sessions. Um, we're going to do on campus and virtual probably next year. So if you're interested in that, uh, you know, drop me an email and I can point you to that. But um, so deep learning has uh, really kind of expanded our way to solve problems. And I'll, I'll show you this in a couple of examples and what that means. So if you're uh, an engineer and you want to understand how to design your material, in this case, a composite, this is actually a some work we've done with my um, really incredible student, Dipanjan Sen, who also came from India um, and now works in a company in New York City. Um, he has sort of um, thought about um, exploring uh, multi-scale materials using computational methods like molecular dynamics. And we've identified which patterns of organizing stiff and soft building blocks and material resist create optimal fracture resistance and what I alluded to earlier. And um, Dipanjan has shown that if you organize materials in a clever way, um, you can achieve what's called toughening or rising R curve behavior. In other words, cracks become more difficult to propagate as they grow. So as the crack becomes larger in your material, your material fails, it becomes, it becomes stronger essentially. And that's what you want in engineering. You don't want your material to fail, you want it to become better as a, a crack actually propagates. And so the conditions to this were very difficult to obtain. In fact, it took a long time, long computational hours to achieve this result. So that was done using conventional simulation techniques. But if you really wanted to explore this very vast design space um, systematically, we would take, we would need 150 plus billion years to do that, even with today's computers. And so the question becomes, can we solve this problem more efficiently? And this is where deep learning comes in. And so we actually came to this by sort of watching the you know incredible advances uh, coming out of, for example, DeepMind in, in the UK and others uh, that have explored sort of ways to play games like Go and chess and other games. and the, the problem in playing a game like Go is basically you move uh, building blocks around, black and white building blocks, and you get an optimal solution. You have a, a game that is won or lost in that sense. And in a composite design problem, you have a very similar type of approach. In fact, the problem space is similarly complex, uh, 10 to the hundreds of combinations. Um, and uh, here we actually we're optimizing the game we're playing here is to move around the material design, you know, changing the material design slightly to uh, win the game in this case, preventing fracture from occurring. And uh, that sort of thinking about using game theory to describe materials uh, and how they mechanically behave using machine learning allows us to fundamentally change the way we model and think about materials modeling, in, in fact. And um, so we have you know, replaced this fine element approach with machine learning in this, in this algorithm. And actually we're able to show that the, uh, the machine learning algorithm is able to very adequately describe how materials behave and find optimal solutions very quickly. In fact, it competes. It's very in very good agreement with the conventional phenomenon modeling, which we consider the current truth. So that's sort of solving Newton's laws. And in, in contrast, using machine learning gives us very similar results, in some cases, identical results. And this um, is actually enabled by a method called convolutional neural networks, which essentially you know, visualize and understand how patterns in the material relate to function properties. In this case, how design patterns relate to particular uh, fracture resistances or toughnesses. And once we have such a deep learning model trained, we can use genetic algorithms to essentially simulate um, evolution. And, and you kind of see this on the right-hand side, so we can very quickly iterate through hundreds, if not billions of combinations in your material 
and finding essentially, like, like nature does, I mentioned earlier the spider web, how nature designs materials through evolutionary principles, through different time scales, construction, artificial intelligence allows us to simulate this. And we could apply this not only to composites, but also to uh, you know, some of the most cutting edge materials like 2D materials, in this case, graphene, in identifying how do we design an optimal graphene structure. And, I, and graphene is one of those uh, amazing wonder materials um, you know, discovered by Kostya Vozilev and Andrew Keim uh, a couple of years ago, uh, they won the Nobel Prize for this. And, and these kinds of uh, materials have you know, enormous promise and you wanna design them as an engineer to be fracture resistant, right? Because you want your device to last for a long time. If you do water filtration, whether you use it for a composite, and you know these uh, artificial intelligence algorithms will actually allow us to design graphene to be optimally fracture resistant. So this is very exciting. Um, we can also apply this to uh, designing new composites. So again, these are um, composites that we've designed using this artificial intelligence algorithm, and uh, we could actually make them experimentally, and I'll talk much more about that later, I'm um, using 3D printing. So 3D printing has become a way for us, my lab, to uh, actually realize computational models. So models that live in my computer and have been optimized by this AI algorithm can be printed within just a couple of hours right here in my in my lab or even in my office in, in some instances. And so methods like multi-material 3D printing are incredibly exciting to actually do that. And they can really rival some of the conventional manufacturing techniques, if not exceed them, because they can create really complex architectures. Now, um, you know, I, I want to sort of take a step back now and, and think, you know, what if you, um, can you using AI also push the boundary in how we model things as engineers and how we interact with our computer, right? So in traditional ways in engineering, you program equations, right? I mentioned this several times already, you know, we took Newton's laws and we you know, write a code and we, we optimize something and we have some maybe Python or C code or something like this. Um, so the question is, can we, as humans, as engineers interact with machines directly through the ways by which humans communicate, which is essentially uh, human language or ideas or thoughts that live in my brain. And this sort of goes to the question that I think AI can also help to answer um, in philosophy of where consciousness comes from and whether a thought, a conscious thought in our brain actually uh, resembles an actual material structure or whether it doesn't. And, um, and so this interaction between human language and the creativity, the imagination of humans, the ability for us to create things on the right hand side, you see some, some carved wood art, which um, a, a human has imagined uh, and then actually manufactured with his or her hands. And this process is, is not possible yet with computers, right? You computers don't um, translate their thoughts or human thoughts into actual matter yet. And so that's something we have actually recently accomplished. And in this work, we have developed a, a entirely new neural network kind of approach to um, you know, give human readable cues as input. And you can kind of see this here, it's a little bit hard to see, but you can describe the material you wanna make, um, like a material that looks like a spider web or a regular spider web lattice. You, know, you can really come up with very creative ideas in describing the material in the way you as humans, we as humans interact. We can now interact with computers and computers will then take these inputs, these cues and through deep learning, develop them into an architected material in this case that can be 3D printed and analyzed and actually touched and felt. And so this is sort of a way by which you can really materialize thoughts and ideas and, and see them and touch them and have them in your hands. And this allows us to do some really remarkable things like developing uh, mechanisms. So you can see here, this is a sort of a classic engineering problem where you wanna develop a, a mechanism, a gripper maybe for a robot or soft robotics. And you can begin to do that actually using, um, using these kinds of algorithms. So, so there's a, an immense opportunity out there in what deep learning can do. Um, and you know, we, we also can apply these techniques in a little more detail. I'll talk now a little bit more about fracturing in how things fail. And if you, you think about failure, um, these problems of failure um, are really complex multi-scale problems. So you think about failure like an earthquake is a fracture in the Earth's crust. So that's something that many engineers have studied. And, and we are, of course, very interested in this because we want to understand how earthquakes create damage in buildings and in infrastructure and railroads and then things like this. Um, and so fracturing begins sort of at that level. You can see the crack even at a scale of kilometers from space, or you can see cracking your windshield glass or in your, your glass or in your table or in your flooring. But 
um, you can look in different magnifications and you can actually see this crack ultimately originates from breaking of chemical bonds between atoms, which is controlled at the angstrom level by quantum mechanics. So this interaction between the quantum mechanical level, the macro level, um, is something that traditionally we understand and model using um, quantum chemistry or molecular dynamics simulations or multi-scale modeling and allows us to beautifully predict actually how cracks propagate, but these are very slow. And so this, these are some of the techniques that uh, Dependent, for example, used in the earlier work I've shown um, in understanding how composites break. And um, the disadvantage is they're very slow. The advantage is they're you know, rooted in, in basically Schrodinger's equation, so they're very powerful and predictive, but um, they can be very slow. And so we have asked the question, can we use deep learning AI algorithms to uh, simplify this problem and actually let AI algorithms observe nature. So sort of going back to pre-Newton, you know, going back sort of to the time when there was no equations in the world um, and all we had is an observation. And in this case, we feed the AI algorithm actually observations and how cracks propagate. So we essentially run um, experiments or simulations of thousands and thousands of different material designs, different microstructures. So those of you familiar with this, microstructure is basically how the material looks like in the inside, um, different grains, different crystals. And, you know, um, and if you change that, the crack direction propagation dynamics will change. And so this is uh, what we want to learn. And so this is sort of what you do when you observe nature as a scientist and you write an a uh, differential equation, or build a model, you, you observe nature and you're trying to capture that in an equation with boundary and initial conditions. Now, here we're not doing this, we're just giving the observation and how cracks propagate to the algorithm. Um, and then we hope the algorithm can predict the right outcome. And so sort of how this looks like is basically we feed the algorithm movies, you know, we watch uh, cracks propagate in a variety of different materials and different conditions. And uh, we feed the algorithm movies, uh, frames of movies and time trajectories to teach the algorithm, well, how this fracture actually propagates and how it depends on the boundary conditions and so forth. And this is achieved by um, a, you know, a combination of what's called convolutional neural networks, which I already mentioned. So these convolutional networks are able to capture hierarchical structures in an image and, and actually analyze the image in that way. Uh, and we combine this using a neural network called an LSTM, which is a neural network that um, understands time trajectories. And so now we're bringing in the time dimension here, the temporal direction of how things happen in nature. And by combining convolutions and LSTM, uh, we're able to actually uh, teach the computer to do that, to solve this problem. And now the computer is predictive. It can predict how cracks propagate and it agrees very well with the observation uh, in an experiment or in a simulation. And we can apply this algorithm now very quickly. So unlike solving Newton's laws in molecular dynamics, right? Or fine element models, here, um, you can run this model on your laptop or in the cloud, and, and you can make predictions within a fraction of a second in really complex materials like, um, for example, gradient materials as shown here, which are very important in bone, for example. And so the predictability is very exciting. You know, we can discover um, that the model can actually understand how um, grain boundaries, like twin grain boundaries, so those of you in the field know, uh, twin grain has a very particular orientations of crystals next to each other, and uh, they lead to a, um, actually a crack deflection, sort of cracks will go straight and then they will deflect. And uh, you can kind of see this here on the, on the, on the left-hand side. This observation is predicted by the model, which is absolutely remarkable because this has not been, uh, the model has not been taught that this is the case. It has learned from the observation that this is actually going to happen. And again, this really leads to us uh, to really be able to, um, you know, view AI algorithms as a complement or maybe challenge to some of the traditional ways. It doesn't mean we don't need traditional modeling, but it is exciting for engineering and science because it opens up an entirely new way of thinking and modeling phenomena in nature. Okay. Um, we can apply this to really complex materials like graphene. Um, and again, it works very well for different materials. Um, uh, in another paper recently, we have actually used this as a design approach so we can um, actually um, design materials that have a predetermined crack path. And this is very important. You want to make sure that your crack, again, as a, in the very beginning, I talked about cracks in materials are very dangerous when they go straight. Right? And so here we have designed a material microstructure that forces the crack uh, you know, to go in a zigzag motion. I'm going to sort of highlight this here. So the crack is it was designed, supposed to go in this motion. And um, when, you, when you run the simulation, both molecular dynamics and you run the uh, the machine learning simulation, it follows exactly this, this path that we've optimized for. This shows that the algorithm can solve a very complex problem, which 
uh, I want to emphasize this would not be possible because of computational limitations with any conventional um, engineering models at this point. Uh, the other thing this model can do, a uh, model like this can do, um, is it can predict uh, stress and strain fields. So this sort of the bread and butter of engineering is predicting fields, right? Uh, using continuum theory, you know, stress and strains and, and pressures and, and temperatures and gradients of those. And the model we've developed, this was published in Science Advances last year with my student, Jen Zi Yang. Um, this model can predict, you know, with incredible accuracy, um, continuum mechanics solutions, which um, are very, very difficult to, to achieve. Otherwise, in fact, um, these are really based on Newton's discoveries um, and typically, you know, requires a solution of a Feynman model. And as you can see here in this detailed comparison, our model can actually uh, reproduce those, those results, um, again, without ever seeing any equation, right? So that's really the key. It's just based on observations. And, um, and that's sort of a, a yeah, very exciting way to think about modeling. Uh, we can simulate crack propagation in really complex materials uh, and again, validate them using MD simulations. So, so there's sort of a, a wealth of directions we can pursue with this. Um, we can make predictions of stresses and strains all the way down to the individual atom. And this um, is, is incredibly exciting for nanoscience and nanotechnology. And, and perhaps uh, nanotechnology, of course, is one of the, um, you know, again, most exciting things of our time is the ability to manipulate matter at the atomic level. Um, and, and this can be achieved um, on the simulation side using AI. And so now you can begin to optimize and, and design materials. Uh, speaking of design, you know, we, um, you know, deep learning allows us to really push the boundary in, in how we create materials designs, you know, and how we make them. You know, in this little movie you're playing in the back, you see them playing in the background, you know, we can see how we have designed materials based on dye atoms. Um, you know, we can make, uh, you know, look to nature, to the ocean, and um, take photos and images and translate these images into entirely newly designed materials, uh, which can be manufactured. Um, you know, we can make materials based on spider webs. Uh, this is a uh, you know material actually defined based on spider webs, and creating an architected material, which uh, you can see in this uh, you know right hand side. This is a printed material at the end. Um, is a very complex geometry and something that you could not manufacture actually using conventional techniques. But three D printing allows us to do that and produce that. Uh, deep learning can solve sort of incredible problems of how materials self-assemble. In this case, <clears throat> it's an example of how deep learning can um, understand how to assemble building blocks, in this case, flames and fire, um, into uh, structural solutions, like on the left-hand side, designing building a house structure, and the right-hand side, building a, a fairy tale garden. And, um, and so these are, again, you know, examples of how um, intersecting both human language um, in describing the final result, but also bringing in the physics, in this case, of flames and fire. And I, I you know, refer to that uh, a couple of papers that came out. This paper actually came out in, in iScience in 2021. If you're interested in reading up more, more on the work on fire and flames that we've been doing recently. But um, you know, what it can do is it can make these movies you just saw in the previous slide, but it can also create three-dimensional solutions. In this case, is a three-dimensional um, sculpture that we've made that resembles the flickering of flames um, uh, in a three-dimensional real touchable uh, material you can hold in your hands. And um, this you know, actually begins to resemble these AI algorithms, the kinds of things that we could do previously only using um, our own imagination and our hands. And, and so again, this is the sculpture I've shown earlier. And those kind of wood-based sculptures, in fact, this uh, flame structure was actually, um, has actually created um, actually created based on the wood um, using 3D printing. And so you can begin to see how we can create you know, incredible, <clears throat> incredibly new forms and shapes that um, previously wouldn't be wouldn't be possible. So, um, you know, this is not only important for fundamentally challenging the way we model stuff, okay, um, but it's also really critical for sustainability. I already highlighted my TED talk on this topic, but um, you know, we can use these architected materials, these designs, in creating incredible architectures. This is a completely synthetic wood-based ink based on biomass. So, biomass is a, a of a a sink for carbon, but usually it's waste. And we have found a way to implement biomass into materials designs, actually creating 3D printing inks from that and creating what's called architected materials. You can kind of see here the architecture and this material, a beautiful internal structure. Um, this structure ranges from the nano level all the way to the macro level. And it's actually created using a, a resin-based, um, SLA-based printing techniques where essentially a liquid resin 
is formed into a, a solid using UV light and uh, you know assembling these multiple level structures in that way. So mimicking kind of trying to get to the point where we can uh, build similar things as nature does in the spinning of silk, for example. So, so shifting gears a little bit, um, the last um, uh, 10 minutes or so before we go to the questions, I, I wanna say I'm really excited and look forward to your, your questions, is to, to think about how we can um, build material sort of really at the, at the molecular level and especially looking to nature, the paradigm of using DNA level information uh, making it into folded structures of proteins and then, you know, characterizing these proteins. And so for this, we um, sort of look to um, in a, really a new way of thinking about how do we model materials, and that's actually using vibrations and waves as a way of understanding matter. Of course, you know, going back to the tradition of quantum mechanics, where we have this wave-particle duality, um, we also have vibration is really important in sound. So you, you're listening to me right now um, through sound, we communicate through sound, uh, birds sing songs, of course. And then we have um, you know, spiders and bees and wasps that actually have uh, sensory mechanisms to map the world around them structurally, not through eyesight, but actually through these tiny hairy sensors, which you see in, in insects typically, this is a stink bug, but you can pick your favorite you know, insect and kind of look at them and, and you can see that these have you know, very, very detailed structures. Humans have used vibrations in communication, of course, as I mentioned, but also in musical creation. So when you think about plucking a harp, um, you know, you're going to have um, vibrating strings which create pressure waves, which our ears can pick up and we can listen to them and hear them. Um, we have vibrations at the molecular level. So this is a, you know example of a molecule. It's It's continuously moving and vibrating. And these motions and vibrations, as I'll show you in a moment, can be made audible. And you can actually create new musical instruments by watching nature's vibrations and using them and exploit them and model materials that also compose new kind of musical ideas. And on the right-hand side, you see vibrations in a spider web. And so you kind of see when the spider um, actually catches prey and locates prey, um, you know, it will interact with these um, with the web and it lives in its vibrational universe. And uh, that's sort of another scale of vibration. So vibrations everywhere. And uh, one of the things that, of course, everyone right now is really worried about is uh, COVID-19 and the pathogen that causes that virus. And this is the spike protein in this virus. And these kinds of, um, you know, viruses have, are, don't look like this, actually. You know, they are actually moving and vibrating, just like the benzene molecule I showed a few slides ago. And so as engineers and scientists, we want to think about new ways of modeling, understanding something like this virus, which is causing um, so much pain and, and hardship and, and damage really around the world. And um, we want to understand how different types of coronaviruses in particular behave and whether their motions, this is some of, uh, one analysis of their motions, um, how that could be correlated potentially with infectiousness and lethality. And uh, this is particularly important um, as we look at variants of this COVID-19 pathogen, which of course is um, you know, currently emerging. We have a new variant uh, coming out right now. Um, and, and so what we've done in this work, this is done by my student, Yi Wen. Um, uh, she has um, you know, achieved some remarkable insights. So she analyzed the motions of these virus spike proteins and shown that um, lethality um, and the infectiousness, I mean, how infectious, how easy it is to transmit this virus and how lethal it is, can be directly correlated with the motions in the spike protein. And, and in fact, uh, you can see how MERS being the most lethal disease to SARS-CoV-2 being uh, the virus that actually leads to the mildest disease, but highly infectious to variants. So, like this was the G614 variant um, and in a follow-up paper, which I, I can't show because it's currently in review, um, we actually have done this for a lot of different variants and we're currently analyzing the Omicron variant as well um, to see whether we can predict using this model how lethal and how infectious that new variant might be. And this sort of brings me to sort of some more f foundational work we've been doing in interacting matter that's vibrating with uh, things you can hear and creativity and understanding how self-assembly works in both material systems as well as in the human imagination or creativity and philosophy. Um, the um, you know, if musical form, depending on the culture and the civilization that has produced them, um, here I'm going to talk more about Western traditional um, musical creation, but I know that India has a, a very, very deep and rich history in music creation and theory and, and assembly, and you can actually uh, you know, draw some of the conclusions there as well. So a lot of these 
musical ideas um, or forms that we've created in different civilizations are based on some physical phenomena. Like for example, in uh, Western tradition, we were dealing with vibrating strings. Um, and even in ancient uh, traditions in many other cultures, we have sort of this as a basis and we create scaling and tuning laws and, and ways by which notes are assembled to form what this culture perceives, a particular culture perceives as uh, beautiful music or, or emotional music or creating a certain expression. And um, that um, sort of is very different from noise. So if you think about sound, uh, random sounds, right, um, create noise. White noise in particular is sort of a, a random distribution across all frequencies. As opposed to when you play an instrument, you're basically forming the noise into something that we call music um, art. And um, this transition from noise, which is disassembled, unorganized to music is something that we see um, in materials as well, right? So when you think about how the spider creates something as beautiful as a spider web, um, or when we as engineers create a composite material, we're doing the same thing, right? We're creating, we're using building blocks, chemical building blocks, and we're reforming them into structures and we're putting them together in a hierarchical assembly to create something like, yeah, an Eiffel Tower or a car or a vehicle or a temple or whatever we might be building. And um, so music works in the same way. And so what you hear in the background, um, play this now is some classical music. And if you, you think about really how music is created, what well, follows rules and laws, but can also use this hierarchical structuring as a building block. And it's maybe a little bit hard to hear, but um, you can listen to this all on SoundCloud. If you go to soundcloud.com and you look for my name, you're gonna find a lot of musical creations based on materials and, and biological systems. Um, and you can listen to some of those compositions. But the point is, you know, when you create music, it's really foundationally created by waveforms, which we modulate and we then create different melodies, and then we use multiple instruments to create something like an orchestra. So what you hear in the background is an orchestra, and so you have many, many different instruments that are playing together. And that um, formation of, of sound um, and structure um, can again be tracked down to patterns, which we heard so much about earlier in the talk, and these patterns can be seen in a score. Um, you can see composers like Beethoven and Bach and others um, through the centuries, and again, in other, in other cultures as well, are using patterns and variations of patterns, variations of frequencies um, to create what we perceive as music. And this um, you know, can be analogly kind of connected directly to what, what material structures look like. And, and so what we've done in the modeling, we've developed methods now to convert materials into sound. And by doing this, we are we're actually allowed now to manipulate sound and then translate the sound back into the material. And so instead of designing a material basically using a CAD program, right? Or manipulating positions of atoms or molecules, we can actually now manipulate sound and actually create new kinds of sounds. And from that new kind of sound, create a new material. So we're taking the detour basically, right? And going to that space. And the space is powerful because it's a universal description of all matter, you know, including of course, spider webs, proteins, molecules, but also fire and flames. You know, these are all fluctuating systems. Uh, human humans are fluctuating as well. You know, we have a we're like a flickering flame being born and die, and uh, and these concepts are you know really universal throughout nature and um, speak the language, the natural language of life. You know that we like to understand as scientists, and so we've you know modeled materials in that way and actually discovered a new musical scale which we call the amino acid scale, and that's sort of the the natural scaling by which. Uh, biology works with converting DNA to proteins through the assembly of amino acids. We can use this to create models of materials um, in the musical space. And so in this case here, we have, for example, a protein called lysozyme converted into a musical score. And so that's what that method can do. Um, and, and of course, um, you know, these um, techniques can be, can be played in many different ways. And you know, once you have a score, and this is some work actually I'm doing with uh, Lindenbaum Orchestra in Korea, um, and some very talented musicians uh, there. Um, and we've been you know, performing some of those some of those pieces as well. So what you see in, here in the background is a, is a, is a you know, orchestral symphonic piece that um, I've written that essentially uh, is a model, a musical model for the interaction of the antibody to COVID-19 pathogen with the spike protein. Right? And so this is a musical reflection of these interactions. So I think it's a beautiful way of understanding um, nature, understanding complex phenomena and, and provides a way to, to not only seeing a protein, but actually listening to a protein. Okay, um, I'm almost at the end. And before we get to the end, I want to show some really you know, remarkable 
new discoveries we've made recently um, with some you know, amazing students, Grace Anderson and Mario Milazzo. Um, and we've published this in a recent paper that just came out. Um, so if you want to check it out, we have sort of gone the other way around. So we've asked the question, if you look at classical music, this is what we've looked at so far. Um, this is Bach's music, Goldberg Variation, which is uh, you know, one of the most important pieces in Western tradition written. Um, the Goldberg Variations provide a, a wealth of data, essentially, that Bach has created. And the question is, what kind of proteins, what kind of DNA code and proteins are encoded in that, in that sound uh, that he created many hundred years ago before knowing about proteins, of course. And we've discovered that if we do this translation now from music into proteins, we could fold these proteins using deep learning. So again, here, the enabling technology is deep learning. Uh, we've been able to show that it creates uh, protein structures which are um, you know, stable. And so this is the protein that's actually created by Bach many, many, well, 100 years ago. And we can actually listen to that as well. And so what we've done here, is you know created a, a variation, a new variation. So those of you familiar with music um, and Goldberg variation in particular, uh, it's a piece that basically talks about variation. That's the whole premise of this piece, and um, it, it, it follows from an initial idea in the aria that Bach manipulates and changes through transformations into incredibly complex and beautiful music. Here we have repeated this process, but not using human imagination, but actually injecting the deep memory of time by which evolution has produced protein structures. And this piece, again, you can actually click on this link again, look at SoundCloud um, and, and listen to the whole piece. It's uh, uh, you know, a variation of the aria, which, which is created um, by intersecting Bach's ideas with biology. Uh, and I think it's um, uh, you know incredible sort of um, way to think about composition. And this is what we are um, working on very heavily as well, is to find new ways of music composition. And, and you can see the engineers are, um, when, when you're an engineer, a scientist, um, and you're creative and you're an artist, you're a composer, uh, you can use very similar tools for this. And I think creativity as an engineer can be uh, multiplied if you are also interested in the arts. And I, I really want to encourage all the young people in this audience to, to think very differently and broadly about you know, how we do engineering and design. So, yeah, so this you know, transformation can repeat it. And in fact, we've created sort of many different proteins from that, uh, uh, from this process that, you know, again, you can kind of see the vibrations here that are, that are all proteins created by Bach. But um, now with the advent of deep learning and nanotechnology can be um, seen for the first time, analyzed for the first time. And we've shown that Bach actually has created through his you know, genius musical composition very similar kind of sequences of amino acids and that nature has also discovered. So this is remarkable. So what that means is basically evolution has created proteins that are similar to the rules, those proteins created by Bach. And uh, there's some really true and broad universality, of course, involved here. Um, very widely important to, to think about um, um, making proteins in the lab. I mean, so we can take these protein sequences, of course, make them in the laboratory and actually create, again, physical realizations of this. We can fold the proteins. Uh, we can develop entirely new protein designs for engineering. These are some proteins designed for as food coatings. This is done with my colleague, uh, Benedetto Morelli, who's a food security uh, expert and, and a, um, interested in actually creating new types of food coatings. So instead of coating your fruit, um, bananas and strawberries using plastic, uh, which creates all sorts of pollutions, um, we're trying to create coatings that can put directly around the, around the fruit and you can actually eat them because they're made from proteins. And, Deep learning can predict some of those um, relationships and mine the data in a way that no other technique can do. Um, these are simulations of protein designs that essentially go through what evolution needs uh, billions of years for. We can do this in you know, a couple of hours on a laptop now and, and identify the best sequences, right? The, the strongest sequences, the best potential silk sequences. We can evolve existing proteins. So this is really fun. You, know, you think about evolution has created yeah, for example, something like lysosamines. So what if you, as an engineer, want to change that and make a lysosam protein that is more stable or less stable or has more beta sheep, more alpha helix? You can use this deep learning algorithm to do that. And you know, concluding thoughts. Um, I, I, I think you've you heard it from my enthusiasm, hopefully. But uh, we live in an exciting time. We live in a very challenging time right now, and I, I, I wish the world will heal from this disease uh, soon. But. Um, uh, we also have uh, tremendous opportunities and we're able for the first time to connect many different fields such as music and art and science and engineering. We'll be able to really go back in time, understand how 
evolution works and how we can push it forward into solving some of the challenges we're facing today, um, including sustainability and disease, public health. Um, and, um, and so these computational techniques are really at the core of that. So machine learning has become a, a staple in solving these problems. And with that, I want to thank you. Um, you know, the idea of universality and diversity is something at the core of this sort of arranging uh, universal building blocks differently across length and time scales is what nature does in evolution. We can now do that as well and, and speak to nature um, in, you know, very innovative ways. And with that, I'm, um, I want to thank you all for your attention. I know it was a lot of stuff, um, but please reach out to me if you want. I, I'm on Twitter, um, all sorts of other social media as well, but um, drop me an email. I will be looking forward to discussing with you. And of course, now we have some time for Q&A as well. So thank you very much. Thank you so, so much for this wonderful presentation. I am... I'm